Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm glad you joined us today as we continue a life-changing series of studies on the teachings of Jesus. Our topic today, Living Like Christ. This is going to be a wonderful study. We're glad you're with us. I want to welcome our Hope Sabbath School team. Good to be together again, isn't it? Right. This series is changing my life. The teachings of Jesus, so powerful, and I'm especially excited today that one of our teams is going to teach. And that's part of Hope Sabbath School. I know many of you write to us and you say, I teach in my local community, or I take the outline, download it from the website, and I use it to teach my class. Because Hope Sabbath School is about not only teaching the Word, but helping people so that they can teach the Word to others. So we're excited that one of our team, Nathan, will be teaching for us today. It's going to be a great study. We're also happy to hear from you and to see how God is using you and is blessing you through the ministry of Hope Sabbath School. And uh, by the way, if you have not been to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess, if you miss any of the programs, you can go back and watch them. They're archived, even, even past series. Another resource is our app. Go to the App Store, Hope Sabbath School. Then you can watch it on your mobile device. Or you can go to Facebook, Hope Sabbath School. We're everywhere. If you click like, we all smile. Because <laughs> we have 51,000 and, and counting. Because Hope Sabbath School is reaching now an estimated 1 million Bible students. Praise God. Isn't that amazing? Amen. And some of you have written to us at sshope at hopetv.org. Here's one from Nkosi in Botswana. Wow. Botswana is in the heart of Africa. And... Uh, Oh, he says, I've got the new Hope Sabbath School app. <laughs> I want to share a testimony. I was sleeping, and I dreamed there was a group of people who were thirsty for the Word, and I was encouraging them to study the Bible. I was concerned about their lack of understanding. Uh, I was trying to refer them to Hope Sabbath School, and, and, and I thought, what would be a good way? And, and I woke up, and I was struggling, and, and, and then I found there was an app for Hope Sabbath School. <laughs> and he said, no, I have it on my iPad. Amen. And what, what an amazing, thank God for the dream, and thank the team uh, for Hope Sabbath School. Well, and Kosi, we're just so glad that God's guiding you there in Botswana. And yes, the app and the website, they're all ways that can help us to connect the word together. Here's one from Bridget, uh, in actually Kevin, Bridget, and baby Hannah, but yeah. Bridget's writing from the beautiful island of Jamaica. Amen. So Bridget, thanks for writing to us. Anybody from Jamaica? Yeah. Oh, we've got two people <laughs> waving. Abigail, Abigail and Elaine, would you wave to Bridget and Hi, Bridget. Kevin? We can all wave, right? Uh, this is really sweet. Bridget writes, says, I'm writing on behalf of my seven-month-old daughter, Hannah. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're watching Hope Sabbath School, she loves the scripture songs. Mm -hmm. Is that sweet? Seven months old. Oftentimes, she wakes up. Whenever the song begins, she looks at the TV, puts her head back down when the song's over. So, <laughs> song, then goes back to sleep again. <laughs> she absolutely loves the scripture songs. Uh, I've learned learn the scripture songs, and I sing them when I put it to bed at night. Mm. Is that beautiful? Amen. The Word of God's Amen. going into her heart. Amen. And then when she wakes up to feed, I sing the scripture song to her again. Hope Sabbath School is such a blessing. We love the insight shared during the study. May God continue to bless the entire Hope Sabbath School team. And by God's grace, we shall meet at Jesus' feet. Amen. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Well, I tell you what, little Hannah is blessed to have a mommy who loves yeah. Jesus. Amen. And Bridget and Kevin, God bless you in your home and as you parent your precious little one. Isn't that an encouraging email? Yeah. Amen. We love to hear from you. SSHope at HopeTV.org. Here's one from Frank in Texas in the United States. And Frank says, I watch Hope Sabbath School every day, several times a day. Wow. It reminds me of Sabbath School when I was a young man. I am an avid watcher and a retired old man. Amen. <laughs> well, you know, it's beautiful that whether we're young or older, that we seek the Lord. Isn't Amen. that right? Amen. Frank, thanks for writing to us from Texas. Andrea writes, she is from Brazil. Any Brazilians? She is living in Australia, though. Mm. It's a long way from home. 
She says, I'm, I'm living at near, near Sydney, Sydney, Australia, with my husband. I love Hope Sabbath School online. Mm -hmm. So she goes to hopetv.org hope slash hopess. You can watch us online. It's been a blessing for me. While I'm far away from my homeland, you've been doing a great job warming my heart every Friday evening. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm part of the class. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. May God bless you. Greetings from Australia. Well, you know, Nathan, who's going to be teaching today, he just said, you are part of the class, Andrea. We've, we've got an estimated one million Hope Sabbath School members around the world. You're an important part. We're so glad you wrote to us. And if you've not written or you'd like to write and tell us what God's been doing, write to us at sshope, hopetv.org. But right now, we want to sing together, not just our small group here, but all of us around the world, our scripture song for this series, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Mm. Talking about the teachings of Jesus and teaching and admonishing one another. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm excited as we study about living like Christ that we're going to see miracles happen in our hearts today Amen. and in Hope Sabbath School members around the world. And we're so happy that one of our team here, Nathan, can teach for us today and we're praying together for blessings from heaven. Amen. Nathan, thanks for teaching our class today. You're welcome. Thank you. Before we begin, let's ask God to bless our study together. Father in heaven, we are glad that we can gather one more time to study your word. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here with us to help us understand it. We don't want to just bring our own ideas to it and try to get out of it what we think it says. We want you to speak to us through your word Amen. today. Amen. So we pray for that to ha happen here and with all the viewers around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, how many of you are good neighbors? <laughs> or how many of you have good neighbors? How many of you have bad neighbors? No, don't put your hands up. Mark Twain said, good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> the, I the idea being, you know, keep the fence high and they stay on their side, you stay on your side, and we're good neighbors. Is that really what it means to be a good neighbor, though? Mm -hmm. God has something different to say about being a good neighbor. And um, we're going to look at this in this series, living like Christ and trying to relate to others the way Christ would. Living like Christ. Um, we'll begin in John 13, 
verse 34. John 13 and verse 34. Elaine, would you read that to us, please? I will be reading from the New Living Translation and it says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. So is that a new commandment then? Jesus says it's new, and yet isn't he quoting something? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yes. What's new about the commandment this time? Why is it new? Puya? Uh, I think the reason why Jesus said it's new is because he added something uh, which says that, as I have loved you. As mm -hmm. I have loved you. Okay, so that's different. Mm -hmm. Now we see this way of loving that hasn't been available to us before because Jesus loved in a way that, I mean, here's God in human flesh showing us God who is love, John told us, right? Mm -hmm. Now he's living love and we're seeing that and he says, now I want you to love each other like that. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another verse here. I'm going to um, actually invite you, we're looking at how Jesus had compassion on people and I want to add a verse that you may not have been expecting to look at in this lesson, but it's Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. Mark chapter 1. We're going to read verses 40 and 41. And if someone is ready to read that, are you there, Jasmine? Could you read for us Mark 1, 40 and 41? All right. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Thank you for reading that. Now, Jesus had what kind of emotion here? Compassion. He was moved with compassion. And we're going to see that mentioned in a few more verses we look at. Do you know what that actually means in the Greek? Does that, some of you I know have a little bit of familiarity with Greek. What is the word and what does it mean? Moved with compassion. It, it, it kind of speaks of pity. A okay. deep sense of, of pity and, and great sympathy. And where is it felt? I thought, I, I thought it actually literally meant you kind of felt it in your innards, yeah. like in your bowels. You feel it's it like right this. inside. Yes. Sometimes we talk about that, you know, when we experience emotion, like we feel it inside of us. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of intense. Yes, and, it, and you actually feel the word is related to the Greek word for spleen. Yeah. So you're feeling it inside. The root word is your spleen. Yeah. You feel it right in there. So Jesus feels it right down in his gut, so deeply. to speak, mm. how deeply he wow. feels compassion for people. Mm. But you know what I wanted to also ask you? What does this man know? What does the leper know as he's approaching Jesus based on what you just read? Uh, he knows that um, Jesus is the one that can, can cleanse him. You can make me clean. Can make All right. Clean. What does he not know? <laughs> if he's willing. <laughs> Jasmine, speak up and say if that again. If he's willing. If you are willing, you can make me. So the question in his mind is, is Jesus willing to make me clean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know he can. Now we're talking. He I know he can, but he will me? he have compassion on me and love me? Mm -hmm. Jesus, is, we're going to try to love like Jesus loves. And we mm -hmm. see here that Jesus, the question in this man's mind is, does Jesus really love me? Would he care enough to make a difference? Mm -hmm. Now think about how difficult that must be. If you're an individual who's he's full of leprosy, I think it says in another one of the Gospels, and he comes to Jesus, you're an outcast from society. That's right. And then to be wondering, does God want to leave me in this condition or does he care? Because there are people in the world today who may be having that same question. Mm -hmm. God, you could fix this situation in my life or you could change the situation, but are you willing? Mm. And what is Jesus' answer? Mm. I, am I am willing. willing. I am willing. Mm. Bliss. And we have to, we've been studying previously that um, the aspect of the leper believing, mm. it, was, it was something that was also in depth in his soul mm. that he actually believed that this was uh, the Messiah, this was Christ, uh, this was a man that had not only the ability but had the compassion yeah. uh, yeah. to, pro, to pr come and, and provide that healing touch or that yeah. healing cleansing. Yeah, and he could have just spoken Absolutely. it, but he actually showed compassion by touching him. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. let's, let's move on, though, and look at some of the other verses that mention this compassion of Jesus. Matthew 9, chapter 36. We'll look at a few verses in Matthew. Matthew 9, 36. Abigail, would you read that for us, please? I'm reading from the... Um New International Version, verse 36? Yes. Okay. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. So here he doesn't have just 
a compassion on just an individual, but we see he has compassion on the crowds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When's the last time you've been in a crowd and looked out at them and said, I have compassion on these people? Wow. You know, sometimes you just feel like, oh, they're just a mass of people. And yet Jesus sees them as individuals and he has compassion on them. Let's take a look at another one of these in Matthew 14, 14. Wilbur, would you read that for us, please? Sure. Um, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 14, it says, And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. Amen. Thank you. Great. Another opportunity or another incident here where Jesus has compassion on a multitude. And one more in Matthew 15, the next chapter, and verse 32. Daisy, would you be willing to read that for us, please? Sure. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Then Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry, or they will faint along the way. And is that the New Living Translation you read? So there it's translated, I... Have compassion. I feel sorry. Feel sorry, sorry, it said. I feel sorry. So the compassion is this also translated there as I feel sorry. Jesus cares about people. Amen. He cares about people enough to actually befriend them. While he was here on earth, we notice he actually had friendships developed with some people. And we're going to take a look at one of those. Look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And we're going to read verse 5 and then verses 33 to 35. Ulrich? Reading John chapter 11, verse 5. It reads, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, and then let's go to verses 33 to 35. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Mm. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Okay, so the background here, I think you may know, is Lazarus who was sick and then he died. He was a friend. Jesus loved Lazarus, Martha, Mary, the, the siblings. And it says that Jesus felt so much for him that he actually groaned in the spirit at this, right? Mm -hmm. And notice... It says that that verse that Bible, you know, Bible students, when I used to teach Bible students to younger students, or Bible class to younger students, and they had to memorize Bible verses, the one they always chose first, I'll memorize John 11:35, right? Why is that? Shortest, Shortest verse in all the Bible. Two simple words, Jesus wept. But how powerful that verse, though it may be short, it's packed with meaning to us. Jesus wept. He identifies with us. He understands. And that compassion moved. And it doesn't just mean like he, a, a tear trickled down the corner of his eye and onto his cheek. No. This, is, this word actually means he wept like with deep groaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This deep moving emotion that he felt. So remember, Jesus is a clear revelation of whom? The Father. The Father. And so if we see Jesus with this deep compassion for human beings, this is giving us an indication of how God feels about his children, right? Okay. Okay, so let's take a look then at some more verses indicating how Jesus loved. Let's take a look at Mark 10, verse 21. 10, 21. This is uh, another individual who had come to Jesus. Joel, do you have that, and would you read it for us? Mark 10, 21, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. It reads, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy, the cross, and follow me. Now, that may seem like a really hard Thing that Jesus asked him to do, right? Go sell everything, give to the poor. But we have to keep it in context. What does it say that Jesus felt about this man? He loved him. He, he loved, loved him. him. He knew this was what he needed. Yeah. And he, out of love, he tells him what he needs to do. But had he known this man? 
Was it like Martha and Mary and Lazarus? No. No, no this is no. someone who just no comes to him, and Jesus loved him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So Jesus doesn't know any strangers that he doesn't mm -hmm. love, in essence, mm -hmm. right? As our creator, as our savior, he loves us and cares for us. Yeah. Let's take a look at another one there in Mark, same chapter, and just up a little bit, verses 13 through 16. Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, and how did Jesus relate to this group of people? Mm. Someone want to read that one for us? Perhaps, Jonathan, you could read that? Okay, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples just scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Mm. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. Mm. That's a picture of Jesus that I love. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the expression, children should be seen and not heard? Oh, yeah. Maybe it's been said to you right, when you were a child. But here Jesus is saying, what could be more precious? There's, you know, these are important, precious souls, and he's welcoming them. And I love to see this picture of Jesus with children on his lap. I can imagine him bouncing on them on his knee and hugging them. They're precious to him. And, and yet others had the idea, that, hey, Jesus is too busy to take time for these little ones. Mm -hmm. Bliss, you have a comment. Um, I'm seeing out of these, uh, an amount of two or three witnesses, the thing is established. That's what the Bible says. So if we're studying scripture upon scripture, you can see that there was a specific type of love that Jesus portrayed. It was an unselfish love. Yeah. Okay, it was a love that came out of unselfishness. Because mm -hmm. we sometimes, uh, the, human, the human heart sometimes, we might try to do things to show our love to other people, but it's sometimes out of a desire for us to get some kind of praise or some kind of um, reaction back to us. But in Christ's uh, uh, way of loving, it was a pure, pure love. Mm. Yeah. It was a love that was deep rooted out of he didn't want anything in return. And this was his pattern. Absolutely. It wasn't like once in a while he, you know, we can all love somebody sometime, you know. He was consistent. But he had this consistent pattern developed mm -hmm. where we see he just was loving and giving. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at another one, this time in Matthew chapter uh, 20 and verse 28. This kind of sums up what his purpose was and why we see him giving this kind of love. Matthew 20, 28. Uh, Loida, could you read that one for us, please? And I'm reading from the New King James Version, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, thank you. So what Bliss was saying is this was an unselfish love, and that's what he's saying. He came to serve, not to be served, even though he was the highest king of kings, right? He came to serve, and then he... The ultimate price in loving, he gave his life as a ransom for many. Okay, let's look at one more evidence of his love. And this is a testimony of others about him and how he loved. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Acts 10, verse 38. I'll tell you, I would love to have people say this about me as a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What they said about Jesus <laughs> summed up so nicely Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And uh, Abigail, if you would read that for us. Sure. I'm reading from the New International Version. Verse uh, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who was speaking these words? Peter. Peter was speaking them. Yes, he was speaking about Jesus and he says, he went around doing good. That's a nice summation of somebody's life. Mm. Went around doing good and it mentions some of the things specifically that he did with power and then what else? Healing. healing. And healing. healing. Yeah. What else did he mention about him there at the end of that verse? That for God, for God, was, God, was, with God was with him. Notice that progression. He was doing good he had the Spirit. Mm. Spirit gave him power, which allowed him to do that good or moved him to do that good. Mm. God was with him. Mm. Yes. Keep that in mind as we think about as followers of Jesus, 
Mm. How do we live like Jesus? How do we love like Jesus? Mm. Seems to be a progression we see there. Mm. And the Spirit is deeply involved in moving us toward that. God has to be with us in order to love like Jesus loved. So this is the way that Jesus loved. And that's the new commandment he gave us, to love the way he loved. All right, now, let's take a look at Luke chapter 10, and specifically what it's like to love a neighbor. Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. And Jasmine, can I ask you to read that for us? Luke 10, 25 through 37. Okay. Written from the New King James Version. And it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Mm. All right, thank you. That's a beautiful story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we're familiar with it, but it really illustrates for us how it is that Jesus wants us to love. Amen. You know, what was the loophole that this guy was finding here? The lawyer comes, this young man, he's trained in the law, and he asks Jesus that question. What does he say? What shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, well, what's written in the law? And he answers very well. He knows the law. You see that in verse 27 where he answered to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor. he quoted that from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And then he says from, Lute from Leviticus 19, 18, what? Love your, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And that was right. Jesus agreed with him. He said, yeah, that's it. You have answered rightly. Do, note that word do, it's something that you're actively, because if, if you just say, I love somebody, but it doesn't show in your actions, mm -hmm. how do I know you love somebody, right? <laughs> yeah. Love should be expressed to show that it's real. So Jesus says, do this. Do this, right? Do what it says there about loving God and loving neighbor, and you will live. Mm -hmm. Okay, matter settled, right? Question answered. Mm, maybe not, because how does he reply then? He wanted to justify himself, it says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so he asked Jesus another question. He wanted to look for the loophole, and what was that question? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Why did he want to justify himself? I, I think um, as a scribe uh, uh, at that time, they had uh, a pretty uh, ethnocentric view of um, God's love for people and they thought that God's love uh, was only showered upon them and he didn't love other people so they thought that we only love us mm -hmm. as, as Jews and Hebrews but uh, to them... Be it had become kind uh, of an expectation that righteous people love righteous people, people but right. they actually added on to it, we're going to see later, mm -hmm. that uh, love your neighbor and somewhere along the line, although it wasn't in the Old Testament text, they added this idea of a, hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. Like that was okay, because yeah. they were enemies. But note what happens here. He's looking for that loophole. Mm -hmm. Who is my neighbor? Because now it's up to my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'll love whoever I consider is my neighbor. Right. Mm -hmm. And who is my neighbor? I want to move on quickly to a couple of points here. 
But I want you to note, too, that word showed up again. What was that word? We saw it, a, a characteristic of God in the way he feels about us. Compassion. 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 The good Samaritan, who's showing what neighborly love is like, the mm -hmm. way God wants us to love, he was the only one, not the priest, not the Levite, but the good Samaritan had compassion. compassion. Mm -hmm. And that's that Greek word. It's even hard to say. Can I say it for you? No, don't. I look well. It's black nitsomai. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> but it means, it refers to the, to the uh, spleen, mm. feeling it deep down inside. So the Samaritan felt it, felt it deep down inside. All right. Move on quickly with me because I know, I see the hands, but we've got a lot to cover here. Loving your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Jesus took probably the most unlikely person that they would have expected to do good. And he used him in the parable. Mm -hmm. Why was there so much tension between Jews and Samaritans? Why, why is it a shocker at the end of the story that a Samaritan is the one who had compassion on this guy? Ulrich? Um, I, I, in those days, uh, the Samaritans, the Jews believed that the Samaritans uh, were into false worship and they had become tainted, so to Well, that not only they believed it, but they were. They kind of had mm. yeah, they their were, own they, temple. They were descendants, their own basically, of the ten tribes who had, you know, the northern you know part, went off right. to Assyria in captivity, and many had mixed with the, you know, the pagan yeah. Assyrians. So the main idea is that they were not pure, pure in their... Pure Jews. They were not pure in, in the race or in their relationship in their with God or their religion. So that was a separation between them. The Jews them. looked down on them, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Here's someone that a Jew would not think of helping, and that's the one that Jesus says, this good Samaritan had compassion and helped the that's others. That's your neighbor. Liz. And I think this is one key um, factor that we should identify. Sometimes too much favor, uh, and this is in the, in the Jews' mind frame, they were thinking that they were better. You see what I'm saying? That in, and that in itself robbed them of that love that the Samaritan that might have been going through trials and tribulations in their lives, you know, it actually, helped, it actually helped the character of the Samaritan to actually shine forth the true character of Christ as opposed to this uh, Jewish person that mm -hmm. has been had so much favor. He didn't appreciate what he had. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, interesting. He, he didn't appreciate what he had. Well, Derek? You know, I think the real lesson here, I know you, and there's a lot to cover here, but is anyone in need is my neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's right. Regardless mm -hmm. of whether they're part of my ethnic group or my even my church or... or you're tracking right along with me. That's where we're going. And Jesus notice... removes all of those barriers. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that's what's yeah. so startling. You know, mm -hmm. basically anyone in need, if the mm. Spirit of God says, help her, help him, right. that person's your neighbor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says in verse 36. So which of these three do you think, my Bible says, was neighbor to him, but you know what the word actually in, in Greek, it's the idea that who became his neighbor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know, my, my to become neighbor. a neighbor. So, the onus comes back on me, not, is that person my neighbor because they're in proximity to me, but can I be a neighbor to mm. that person? Mm -hmm. Can I become a neighbor? You see, the way you become a neighbor is you get close to somebody, right? right. Miss mm. I believe God was trying to tell, teach the lesson the way God sees humanity. He doesn't see ethnicity. He doesn't see mm. age. He doesn't see, you know, all these things that we as human beings see. He just sees people that we, we as a group, we need to love. Mm. And without and the barriers to them. take away all the difference, oh. all the, you know, yeah. he goes right past that. Yeah, That's we're all beautiful. equal in Jesus. Jonathan? Just um, your point when this becoming a neighbor, I, I was thinking of kind of this idea that, I mean, back to who we defi define as part of us, as part of, I mean, I know it, I, I, we're in a society that in many cases has moved beyond some of the racial things, but there's still things, I know in myself, that I, I have to look at and say, okay, Lord, am I allowing my identity of who I am to affect how I treat other people? And, and mm -hmm. Christ very clearly says, it, no, your, your identity is found in living like me, is in Amen. drawing this boundary Amen. and saying, okay, it's in, it's in looking at how God identifies, uh, cares for people, the value that God puts on people and, and, and living this, this life of, of becoming a neighbor to everyone around right. you. Mm -hmm. Good. Beautiful. So there's a connection between this idea of the Good Samaritan parable mm -hmm. and what we see in Matthew 7, verse 12. So I'm going to ask someone to read that. This is what we sometimes call the golden rule. It's been referred to. Matthew 7, 
verse 12. Puya, could you read it for us, please? Sure. Uh, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, whatever you want man to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets is the law of Moses and then the prophets after. And summing up the Old Testament, Jesus says, whatever you want others to do to you, do you do to them. Mm -hmm. Do you know that there was a popular um, expression of the time by, taught by rabbis and even yes. non-Jewish people which said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. It was kind of in the negative. Yeah. Hey, you don't want people to steal from you or to be violent against you or harm you, so don't do it to them. But Christianity isn't just a religion of what we don't do. Mm, like, I'll just live here and I won't hurt anybody. I'll be in my section of the world. Christianity is Jesus loving others, right? So through us, he loves others and we go out and we do Beautiful. good. Yeah. It's a positive expression. Yeah. Jesus is the first one to express that teaching that has been around for a while, but he flipped it and he's the first one to express it in a positive way. Do unto others, not like the bumper sticker I've seen before. You know, it says, do unto others before they do unto you. You know, like you get one up on them. No. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. So, who's my neighbor? Anybody in need. What should I do for them? Just what I'd want them to do for me if I were in need. You see how Jesus is making this clear for us? How do we live like Jesus? Okay, let's take a look then. Well, maybe before we move on, ask this question. Can I be a neighbor to everybody who's in need? I look around me in the world, I see a lot of needy people. I turn on the screen and I see, you know, sometimes on the TV, uh, someone pleading or I get emails of people in need in this country or that country or next door and there's a good cause here and there's a good cause there. Can I meet everybody's needs? Puya. I don't think it is possible to meet, you know, everybody. Um, but our duty is to make a difference in the part of the world that we live in. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So God will give us opportunities, yeah. and then we should use those opportunities to make a difference right here, right now, yes. where I am. Mm -hmm. Because maybe that's the very reason God planted you in that part mm -hmm. of the world, right? That's right. Okay, thank you. Let's go on then to loving those in need from Matthew 10, verse 40 through 42. Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42. And Lloyda, could you read that for us, please? Um, yes, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And verse 40 says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So I guess if we sum this up, thank you, Lloyda. It's like God is saying, when you go out, you're going as my, represent mm -hmm. my representation to the world, right? You're my right. emissary. You're my representative that takes the character of God to people showing as Christ lives in you. Even giving a cup of cold water can be an expression of love to mm -hmm. someone in need. Mm -hmm. Take a look then with me at Matthew 25, another beautiful illustration through a story form, Jesus taught these powerful par parables and uh, gave these teachings that sum things up for us so well to help us really understand what God is like. Matthew 25, and we're going to read verses 31 through 46. It's a little bit long, uh, but if I can ask Daisy, would you read that for us, please? Hey, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in His presence, and He will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right hand and the goats at His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, 
and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Mm. Wow. Amen. Amen. How does that make you feel? Mm. I mean, Jesus says, if you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've, you've done, done it unto me. me. But if you haven't done it, mm -hmm. it's like you've turned your back on Jesus, too. Mm -hmm. That's a teaching that kind of hits you ugh, right in the chest squarely and says, I have an obligation mm -hmm. to care for those that Jesus identifies with. Mm -hmm. I'll share just a brief story, and then, and then I want to come to you, Puya. I met a hitchhiker once. I picked him up because I thought I was going to be driving halfway across the country uh, to transition to a new point in my life. And I said, if you're not in a hurry, I can take you tomorrow. And he said, no, I'm not in a hurry. You know, so we're going to be driving across several states. Turned out I had to keep him, live with him for a week because I, circumstances didn't allow me to leave. So I got to know this guy very well. His name was Robbie. He had... He was an ex-junkie, an uh, ex-heroin addict, and he was backpacking to, somewhat, to meet somebody and living with this guy for that period of time and then taking him to where he was going. Mm -hmm. I showered love on him, not like, uh, you know, what a great guy I am, but I said, he needs some help. He's out here on the road alone, mm -hmm. homeless, trying to get somewhere. And so at the end, when I, the last night I paid for his motel room and gave him money for breakfast, I said, Robbie, do you know why I've done all this for you? And he says, well, I know you're a Christian and all. That's, that was his answer. And I showed him this passage. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jesus identified with you, and he wants us to love each other that way. Mm -hmm. And I gave him a, a book about Christ, and I said, I hope to meet you in heaven. He tucked it away in his backpack. But, you know, that's a powerful story, and hopefully... Pray for Robbie when you think of him, okay? Because I want to introduce you to him in heaven. <laughs> Puya and then Missy. Uh, yeah, just looking at this parable, we see two groups. One group that did, although they didn't know that they were doing for Christ, and the other group, the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important lessons that we can learn from here is that Christianity is not always about what we do. Sometimes it's about what we do not do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Missy. I think that when we reach out to people who are in need, it is an opportunity to uh, demonstrate Christian love so that they may come to know Christ as well. And their hearts may be open mm. to, to the message. Yeah, they may not be open to a Bible study mm -hmm. right now or a sermon, but when you show the love of Christ to them, that could touch their hearts and change them in another way, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at what uh, we loving people in need, but we also have to talk about Christ said we are to love more than just people in need or people who are, you know, close to us and maybe easy, a little easier to love. But he actually calls us to an even higher standard, and he says what? Love your enemies. 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 So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, and if somebody would read that for us, verses 43 through 45, Ulrich. Uh, reading from the New King James Version. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just 
and on the unjust. All right, thank you. So Jesus is lifting the bar, raising the bar. He's saying, I, I have a higher standard for you. You have heard, and he's referring to whom? The teachings of Rabbi Moses, Moses, right? No, you have heard. Mm -hmm. and, and all through this, you see he's referring to, it was said this, but he raises the bar. He says, the law isn't just something to be observed outside, but he makes it personal, the implications there. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned also that the law never said, hate your enemies. That kind of became an addition from the rabbis. rabbis right. says, okay, you've heard that. But I say, love your enemies. That's a high standard. Mm -hmm. If your religion is just, I mean, because it's easy for the world can do that. People who aren't Christians can love people who are lovable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But how hard is it to love someone who's not lovable? Mm -hmm. You want to show the love of Christ? That's what you do. And he's raising us to that challenge. Mm. I think you had a I comment. Say, I was going to say what easy. you said about it's so easy. It says even um, criminals love those people who... Um, work with them, who mm -hmm. do what they're supposed to do. But you cut them the wrong way and they would just hit you. That's yeah, what yeah. criminals even would do. And so we as Christians who are following Christ's footsteps are called to live a higher standard that mm -hmm. it's a challenge that now instead of hating those who hate you, love them. Mm. And it's not just loving them um, just for loving's sake, but maybe through that love that you show that enemy or whoever that is, it could help them also be saved because God is not about just one person. He wants us all to Yeah, be and Jesus wasn't just speaking words that, you know, hey, here's an idea for you to consider, and I challenge you to do this. He lived that way, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Take a look at it, mm -hmm. and notice in Luke chapter 23, 34, we're going to see that Jesus actually loved his enemies, and we see how he did so here mm -hmm. in the crucifixion scene. Luke 23, verse 34. Joel, could you read that for us, please? Sure, and I'm reading from the King James Version. It reads, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Oh. Here are some mm -hmm. brutal, heartless men, a dying man, they're gambling for his clothes. That's all he had, his only earthly possessions. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. What an illustration of love, Abigail. Um, I was also going to say that um, at one point, you know, sin separates us from God. So we at, at some point were God's enemies, mm. you know, yeah. and yes. through the cross, he's mm. reconciled himself or rec mm. reconciled us back to him. So I think in a larger sense, just being Christians, if we're trying to reflect the character of God, then we in turn need to love those yeah. who yeah. are... Would you mind... Abigail, would you read a text related to that sure. for us? It's found in Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22. <laughs> Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Colossians 1. Okay, Colossians 1. 21 and 22, I'm reading from the NIV. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Okay, so you spoke about sin being this thing that alienates us from God mm -hmm. and God didn't, he wasn't comfortable leaving us in that condition while we were yet enemies, right? That's when he came for us, Paul says. Yeah. And so he was, yeah, he was saying, I'm going to love my enemies. Those who have turned away from me, mm -hmm. alienated themselves, he's going for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, take a look at Romans chapter 12 as well and verse 21. How do we react when people treat us with, who are evil, treat us in this way. How do we react to evil in this world? Wilbur, I'm going to ask if you would be willing to read that for us. Okay, Romans 12, verse 21. I'm reading from the New King James Version. All right, it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do not be overcome by evil, but what do we do? Overcome. We overcome evil with good. With good. Mm -hmm. Romans 12, 20. Now, let's look at the verse just before that. Would you read that for me as well? Verse 20. All right, verse 20. It says, 
Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Okay, so overcoming evil with good. Here's an enemy who's hungry. Now that's your enemy. You can say, good. I want to see my enemy <laughs> go hungry. But no, he, Jesus teaching here through Paul, he says, do what? Feed, him. Feed your enemy. Yeah. Show good. Or if he's thirsty, give him a drink. But then this strange addition on there that kind of, we could misinterpret it. It says, for in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Well, maybe that's what you'd like to do to your enemy, right? Heap <laughs> coals of fire on his head. But what is meant by that? I think to know, maybe we need to look back at, uh, your Bible may tell you that that's a quotation from somewhere in the Proverbs Old Testament. 25. Would you read that for us? Ulrich, Proverbs 25 and verses 21 and 22. Mm -hmm try to understand what this means when we're treating our enemies this way and we're heaping coals of fire on the head. Proverbs 25 verses 21 and 22. Thank you Ulrich. I'll read it from the New King James Version. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For, you so, for so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. Okay, so now it even tells us, it goes a little further, and we understand that it says, the Lord is going to reward you if you heap coals of fire on his head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. You know, well, or maybe it's referring back to something else, Derek. I used to think that that meant by heaping coals of fire, you were going to burn them up. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. but, but I don't think it's that anymore. No, no. Yeah. Because that's... That's not what Jesus told us to do. Yeah. He told us to love our enemies. So I think the heaping coals, maybe they're so cold and frozen and <laughs> showing no affection to us yeah. that actually by showing love to them, I think what Jesus did when he said, Father, forgive them, and a centurion says, wow, this is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Something happened by those coals. So I don't think those coals are like burning, incinerating. Punishment or something right. either. So. What happens is, you know, there's a mention of coal, uh, burning coal somewhere else in the scripture. And without taking time to look at it, I'm going to challenge you to read it on your own. But you may Isaiah be familiar with six. it. Isaiah 6, right? Yes. Yep. Where he hears the angels praising him. He says, woe is me. I don't live like that. I don't have constant praise on my lips. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. But what does an angel do? He takes up live burning coal off the altar with tongs and touches it to Isaiah's lips. Mm -hmm. And this is a symbol of removing guilt and purifying of sin. Mm. So when live coals are heaped on your enemy's head, it's giving them an opportunity for what? What did we talk about in an earlier study together? Repentance, which can lead you to understand the love of God, right? So, and actually, it's interesting because there was this um, cultural context around them. Egyptians used to, to show repentance. Sometimes they would take a, a, carry a pan of burning coals on their head on their way to the one that they were going to ask forgiveness from. Yeah. Mm. And so this was an idea where, you know, you have this association to repentance. And then I also heard a rabbi when I was studying in Jerusalem, he said, well, no, actually, people carried fire in the old days. And so it was, if your fire went out, when you ca carried those coals, you know, had a cushion between your head to like an insulation, and you carry those live coals. If the fire went out, then you had the problem of starting fire again. And so by putting a burning coal on, you're doing a favor to... So there are lots of ways to interpret that, perhaps. But what we see is certainly if God is going to reward you, you're not getting vengeance upon mm -hmm. them. That's not what it's about. It's about bringing some good. Yeah. Now, I see a lot of hands, but I, we're looking at the time. And I do want to just move on to some further points here. We're overcoming good, evil with good. And that's exactly what we see in the life of Stephen, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. where he is... Like Jesus, he prayed like for Like Jesus, them. yeah. Forgive, forgive them. them. Same kind of a prayer. Yes. You can look at that in Acts chapter 7 on your own. But let's take a look then at John 15. Coming back to this important idea of abiding in Christ and the love. If we're in him, we can love like he does. John chapter 15. And I'm, we're going to summarize. Just look at... Uh, we've looked at this in previous lessons. Maybe we can read verses 8 through 12. And uh, Elaine, would you read that for us, please? I will be reading from um, the New Living Translation, John 15, verse 8 through 12. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. 
I have loved you even as, my, as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. As Jesus loved, notice that progression. You keep his commandments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you're abiding in his love. That's right. And what do you have? Joy. Joy. Mm -hmm. Not just joy, but you're overflowing with joy. Mm -hmm. Hey, people want to be around that, people like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you think people around you could use some joy and love in their lives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our challenge, to live like Jesus did and to love others the way he has loved us. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Thank you, Nathan. Powerful lesson yes. and a great challenge. And I, I find myself, maybe you do too, saying, uh, I need help. I need a miracle of God's spirit to be able to love like Jesus loved, to live like Jesus. And when people see that miracle, they are drawn to know Jesus themselves so that they too can know his salvation and can then be a witness for him. What an amazing miracle is replicated over and over again. I want to pray for that miracle and thank God for the study that we've had today about living like Jesus. Our Father in heaven, we're amazed at your plan for our lives, that you want us to reflect the beauty of your character, to live like Jesus, not to earn your love, but because we are your redeemed children. And by your spirit, the beauty of your love can flow through us. God, we pray for that in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School today. What a life-changing series of studies on the teachings of Jesus. And we've been challenged today to let Christ's life be revealed through us that those around us can be blessed, that love flowing through us to bless those around us.